This is GTV, YouTube the way it was meant to be. The Christmas season means many things to many people, but if you're of a certain age, it meant one thing. Video games. As many as possible. Maybe that's still the case today for some of you out there watching this. Each year brings its own standout must-have games, and most of the time, everyone goes to bed on Christmas night very happy. But one year, things didn't really go as planned. This is the story of Christmas 1988, and a new phrase that entered many of our homes. Chip shortage. Tonight, a GTV exclusive. Nuts from Nintendo. 1988 was the year of Nintendo, when the company's fortunes exploded. When they were not only the market leader, but also a cultural juggernaut. It was the year when video games as an industry would fully recover from Atari shock. For the first time, Nintendo was getting mainstream media coverage, and not all of it good. TV news shows covered the company as a hot new craze from Japan. Some of it was moral panic, some of it was genuine interest, and a lot of it was a decryption aid for parents to understand what exactly their kids were asking for for Christmas. It could have been an even bigger year for video games in 1988, but the market was caught off guard and couldn't deliver enough games to everyone who wanted them. People called it a chip shortage. At least that's one of the stories that went around. Some people felt that Nintendo were holding back inventory to clear out old stock for a crazed market who would buy up anything, to drive up demand and increase the pressure to buy Nintendo's games when you see them for fear that they'd be gone quickly and you wouldn't get the chance again. But how much of the chip shortage was actually real? How much of it was media spin? Did Nintendo purposely short their inventories to drive up demand? In this report, I'll dissect the events of 1988, examine all sides of the story, weigh it against information not known at the time, and render my verdict on what actually happened. If you wrote a letter to Santa in 1988, stay here. You won't want to miss a second of this. Nuts from Nintendo will return in a moment. So the boy fell asleep in the Toys R Us store. And he woke up with toys from the ceiling to the floor. We've got the Nintendo Action Set, including the control deck with double game pack and zapper light gun for just $99.99 at Toys R Us. And we have all the hottest game cartridges at great everyday low prices. Love growing up with my Toys R Us kid. Toys R Us. You'll never outgrow us. Where were you when you first got Super Mario Bros. 2? How about The Adventure of Link? These two games, along with others, were released in the fall of 1988. Chances are you didn't play them that year. Sure, there were a lucky few who got one or both of these games, but 1988 was a year where supply and demand were 180 degrees out of phase. Let's try to go back in time to put yourself in the shoes of a person, young or old, trying to make sense of all that was happening. Entering 1988, Nintendo had clearly dethroned Atari as the market leader of home gaming in America. In 1985, they released the Nintendo Entertainment System in New York City and other major markets in 1986. In 1987, Nintendo sold over 3 million Nintendo Entertainment Systems, or NES for short. NES or NES to some people. Atari fell to second place, selling just over a million Atari 7800s. With all those NESs went a lot of games. The Legend of Zelda, Metroid, Kid Icarus, and the game that was included with so many machines, Super Mario Bros. The cohort of NES owners of these first few years were given a free newsletter, the Nintendo Fun Club News. Inside were tips and tricks, as well as previews of new games. In 1988, 7 million more NESs were sold. Those new owners would also be looking excitedly to the newest games. 
With over 10 million machines in American homes, it would mean a lot of copies of games had to be made to make everyone happy. Fine, so just make more. Well, it was a little more complicated than that. The two games that caused the biggest headaches in 1988 were Super Mario Bros. 2 and Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link. But of course, as a kid, no one really understood why the games were in short supply. I mean, yes, everyone knew why they were sold out, being the must-have games of 1988. But every time someone would ask a clerk at the local store when more copies would come in, they had no real answer. Let's put this into perspective as to why your average young Nintendo fan would be so frustrated by this chip shortage. Nintendo of America first announced Zelda II The Adventure of Link not too long after the original Legend of Zelda was released. The fall 1987 issue of Nintendo Fun Club News listed Zelda II as coming soon. The next issue, winter 1987, showed screenshots and even declared that Zelda II would come in a gold game pack, just like the original Zelda. With this info in mind, it seemed like Zelda II was finished and on its way. It's also worth pointing out that Dragon Warrior is mentioned a few pages down the line, which is another game that came out much, much later. The next issue, February-March 1988, had a review of Zelda II. That's because the game was originally planned to be released in February 1988. The April-May 1988 issue had Zelda II on the cover. Yet, if you went to a store right after reading this issue, you could not get the game. It was not available yet. The next issue, June-July 1988, had an article titled, Where's Link? And for the first time, Nintendo admits a chip shortage. After this issue, Nintendo Fun Club News was renamed Nintendo Power, and the first issue of that magazine, July-August 1988, is very well known, with a full spread of Super Mario Bros. 2, another game seemingly finished, but nowhere to be found. Nintendo Power was the first media about Nintendo that many encountered, much more than the Fun Club News. The Super Mario 2 issue ran a feature about The Legend of Zelda's second quest, but only a short paragraph about the adventure of Link. It would lead many kids, just coming aboard, to think that Zelda 2 wasn't even ready to show off by mid-1988. But the game was finished, just stuck in limbo. For what it's worth, Nintendo Power did announce both Mario 2 and Zelda 2 as ready for sale in October. Nintendo then moved the release date of The Adventure of Link back to November, and then December, noting very limited quantities would be available. Zelda 2 was on the cover in January 1989 with a full review, for the second time. Even then, very few people could get a hold of the game. I was fortunate enough to actually find a copy of Super Mario Bros. 2 on release day in October 1988, solely based on the fact that my family had just happened to be in the store as they were putting the game on the shelf. Everyone within viewing range of the electronics counter lined up and the games were gone. I came up empty handed on Zelda 2, but another neighborhood kid did get a copy and we ended up arranging a trade, Mario 2 for Zelda 2. A game trade so legendary that it's still talked about from time to time at Forest Grove Elementary School. The news media started to report on Nintendo as the company started to take over the home game market. The best story out of the bunch, and certainly the most well remembered, was by John Stossel on ABC's news magazine 2020, airing Friday nights on ABC, right after Full House and Mr. Belvedere. In his Nuts for Nintendo package, John Stossel covered the intensity of the Nintendo craze. One guy interviewed even drove from Indiana to New York just to try his luck at finding a copy of Mario 2 and or Zelda 2. The kids love the games, and some parents are concerned about the lost study time that goes into playing games. If they were in a public school, that's probably a good thing. But parents were also concerned that they couldn't deliver the Christmas presents that their kids were looking for. John Stossel delved into the question of why, all of a sudden, this year, video games were out of stock. Despite Nintendo being around for three years, and home games themselves for over 10 years at this point, there had never been problems before with fulfilling demand. There were interviews with industry experts, including members of Acclaim, a third-party publisher of NES games. They all spoke of the unprecedented growth of gaming and the difficulty of meeting demand. John Stossel visited Nintendo both in Japan and in America, 
He got to see how the games were made, and he saw hundreds of copies of Super Mario 2 that would soon go on sale. He spoke with Peter Main, who said he had no idea that the demand would be so huge, and brushed off the notion that Nintendo was purposefully holding back supply. John Stossel even told Barbara Wawa he stayed up late at night playing Nintendo while producing this piece, and that his son loved Duck Hunt. It was a great package and a wonderful treat for a young boy like myself, staying up late, waiting for my dad to come home from working a double down at the plant. Every kid in school saw it, and it was probably the only time kids were talking about a news program on Monday morning. I'm going to go off track here, but just for a minute, and say that I'm glad John Stossel was the one to cover this topic. He always had a style that challenged the status quo. He prodded and questioned people in a way no other journalists did, and tipped over many sacred cows in the process. In a way, John Stossel was a bit of inspiration for me, personally, as I ended up for a while working as a TV news director for an ABC affiliate, and I actually followed John Stossel occasionally with the 11 o'clock local news. I even kind of look like the guy, with the right mustache at least. It wasn't the only news story about Nintendo in 1988. 48 Hours and Inside Edition also had similar pieces that same year, as well as a handful of local stations. They all marveled at the success of Nintendo, questioned their business practices, and conceded that games are likely here to stay. But what of the chip shortage? Was it fact or fiction? When we come back, I dig deep to find the truth about whether the chip shortage was conspiracy or reality. Nuts from Nintendo will return in a moment. Super Mario is back. He's blasting worlds where no one has ever been. He's taking on enemies no one else dares. This time Mario pops up power wherever he goes. So he's bigger and badder than ever before. You've never seen creatures like these. You've never had an adventure like this. It's everything you've dreamed of and worlds more. It's Super Mario 2, only from Nintendo. Now you're playing with power. The news media in 1988 gave us some insight into the goings-on at Nintendo, but never really nailed down the answer of what was keeping games sold out, other than that they were extremely popular. John Stossel did a great job, but his piece was about 9 minutes of a 1 hour show, 45 minutes probably after commercials. He didn't have much time to get his story across, and with having to explain to audiences who might not know how an NES works, getting too technical would have baffled most of the viewers. They pop the cartridge into this deck, which attaches to any television set. These controls direct the characters. But the answer to the chip shortage is out there. It was a phrase that was used a lot, in stores, by kids, and even by Nintendo themselves. It's a term that's pretty easy to grasp. Video games have chips inside, and there weren't any available. But a chip shortage isn't just limited to Nintendo games. It's a phenomenon that affects the whole computer industry, and it's actually pretty common. In the industry, it's known as a chip famine. I guess people who spend their days watching TV, playing games, and eating snacks wouldn't understand the word famine. As technology moves forward, computing standards increase. When an increase of performance is significant enough, demand will rise for newer chips and outstrip the current supply until the time when that demand can be fulfilled. While this is happening, the market and the manufacturing space is split between the current generation and the next generation. As the newer chips become standard, the older chips stop being made, and all production goes towards the newer chips. The supply will increase, and the price will fall. Another leap in technology will happen sometime later, and the whole cycle will repeat itself, typically every four to six years. Sometimes natural disasters like fires or earthquakes stop the supply chain. In some cases, geopolitical factors like trade blockades or failed treaties will interrupt distribution, leading to shortages. Looking outside the specific case of 1988, in the mid-90s, PC makers were hit with a shortage of RAM. Sony had shortages of the PlayStation 2 in its first year. And Nintendo, again, had a shortage of Wii hardware from 2006 to 2008 due to underestimating demand. In 2016, the NES Classic had the same issue. But these are all hardware, which are more complex, more expensive, and use many more components overall compared to software. 
Also, the supposed chip shortage only affected two games, Super Mario Bros. 2 and Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link. Of course, if you couldn't find those games, there were about a hundred more that you could buy. And if your kids were asking Santa for new NES games, you'd probably have to buy those. Admittedly, it felt a little fishy that Nintendo hadn't prepared for such a big holiday season, knowing the numbers they sold in 1987 would probably increase in 1988, and that they had promoted these games, giving kids the expectation that you could buy them. In the years that followed 1988, the truth started to come out about Nintendo's policies and practices. There were court decisions where Nintendo both won and lost over price controls, game rentals, and third-party licensing. Books like Game Over by David Sheff and Console Wars by Blake Harris interviewed every side of the industry. All of these materials showed how Nintendo took over and how they behaved once they were king of the hill. Nintendo had instituted a strict policy for allowing a company to produce a game playable on the NES. Game cartridges had to carry a chip inside that communicated with the hardware in order to run. Without the OK from Nintendo, it wouldn't play. That's standard practice these days, but Nintendo also limited the number of game titles a licensee could produce in a year. They had clauses in the licensing contracts that a third-party publisher couldn't produce a game for a competing machine for at least two years. Nintendo also controlled the number of copies of a game that would be made. If a game didn't sell well enough, Nintendo stopped making it. And all NES games were manufactured and distributed from Nintendo HQ in Kyoto, Japan with a third-party publisher paying for the privilege of doing business with them. Games on a chip also took a long amount of time to produce. To get a game from the production line to the store shelf took at least three months, and that's under ideal circumstances. The norm today for a game on Blu-ray disc is about three days. Digital downloads take even less time. It might be hard to remember, but there was a time where all you could do is wait and wait and hope to get lucky. On the retail end, some stores that sold NES games were forced not to carry games Nintendo didn't approve of or by their competition. Nintendo ended business with stores that did. Nintendo never accepted return stock or price reductions. Defenders of Nintendo say these moves were done to enforce a strong brand image and were necessary to keep the market stable. Critics have called it greedy and have said Nintendo was a bully for these practices. These policies helped build the case, for some people, that the chip shortage of 1988 was another one of Nintendo's dirty tricks. However, all of this does lead to some hard facts. Nintendo games would command top dollar and be in high demand. When the sales of certain games slowed down, they fell out of print. So you had to constantly be on the lookout for the game you wanted or you might miss it. So while there was talk of a chip shortage and evidence that stores couldn't get enough games, it wasn't entirely the fault of Nintendo. During their ascent, the semiconductor industry was in a tight squeeze. Japanese chip manufacturers like Toshiba and NEC were selling components to personal and business computers in the United States at a loss, much cheaper than domestic manufacturers could sell for. This practice is known as dumping. In the 1980s, the Japanese yen was very weak and only half the value of what it is today. Japanese companies could afford to take a hit because first, the price difference wasn't too dramatic when converting back to Japanese yen, and second, it pushed out any other competition, leaving the marketplace all for themselves, wherein the price will increase later due to a lack of competition. The dumping of Japanese computer chips led the United States government to engage Japan and enter talks that led to a trade pact in 1986. This pact forbade Japan from selling chips below cost, as well as allowing Americans easier working permissions in Japan, which is indirectly how I wound up in Japan myself. The pact led to some unintended consequences though, mainly that after the pact was enforced, Japanese manufacturers stopped selling mass amounts of chips in the United States. Sure, Japanese chips were still available, just not as many. And under the trade pact, the lowest possible price was much higher than before. American manufacturers were still in the game, but were a non-factor for this story, as Nintendo of America's games were made in Japan with Japanese parts. This pact and the diversion of supply coincided with a generational change within the computing industry. The standard of computing performance was about to jump up, as it always does. 
The standard chips at the time of the 1986 US-Japan Semiconductor Pact were about 256 kilobits, while the next generation would be one megabit, four times the size. As is the case each time, to accommodate the next generation, some production of the 256 kilobit chips stopped, leading to a split between the 256 kilobit and 1 megabit process. The changeover to the 1 megabit process went into full swing near the end of 1987 and accelerated there throughout 1988. The chips were soon to be obsolete for PCs, but it was the exact chip needed for Zelda 2. Nintendo was caught between these two events. First, Nintendo and its suppliers were restrained by the 1986 pact, and Nintendo's games, Zelda 2 in particular, required the kind of chip that had its production lowered, all while demand for its games were soaring. Nintendo may have seen these events coming. In 1986, Nintendo in Japan released a peripheral for the Japanese version of the NES, the family computer called the Disk System. This machine would read data from magnetic disks. Games would only cost 2,500 yen, or about $15. And to rewrite an old disk with a new game cost only 500 yen, or about $3. Many of Nintendo's games, including Zelda 2, and the game Super Mario Bros. 2 was based off of, Doki Doki Panic, were only sold on disks in Japan, never on cartridge. In America, the situation was actually more problematic. Nintendo let some games fall out of print, so components could be used for newer games. Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. would also disappear, but the two-in-one cartridge Donkey Kong Classics, which had both games combined, was produced as a way to keep the games in print while using half the materials. It wasn't only Nintendo. PC makers were hurting, but so were Atari and Sega, Nintendo's rivals at the time. Together, Atari and Sega had less than 15% market share, but they too felt the pinch as Sega pushed some games back to 1989, and Atari went to court with its suppliers over prices and supply. It really seemed like no one was safe from the chip shortage. With this information in mind, it really changes my perspective of what was going on, but we didn't know about back then. When we come back, I give my thoughts and opinions on all that went down in 1988. Nuts from Nintendo will return in a moment. Zelda. The Legend of Zelda continues. Defeat your enemies, save the kingdom, use your sword. Beware. I cannot help you. Zelda. Find the crystals, rescue the princess. Zelda 2, The Adventure of Link. And now, get into the latest Nintendo games, Ghostbusters 2 and Iron Sword. Only from Nintendo, now you're playing with power. As the calendar turned to 1989, talk of the chip shortage went away. More PCs adopted 1 megabit chips, and talk was already underway for a 4 megabit chip, which would create the same issue all over again. Nintendo's games adopted larger chips, and more advanced games were made. A new generation of 16-bit hardware was also underway. Copies of Zelda 2, Super Mario 2, and other new NES games became more plentiful, though still not as many as people would have liked. Despite the chip shortage, Nintendo sold 33 million cartridges in 1988, though it was estimated they could have sold 12 million more on top of that. Of the 33 million, Super Mario Bros. 2 and Zelda 2 combined were less than 1% of that number. By the end of the Nintendo Entertainment System's life cycle, Super Mario Bros. 2 sold 10 million copies. Zelda 2 sold 4 million copies, which includes a reissue a few years later. The US-Japan Semiconductor Trade Pack of 1986 was renewed in 1991, and again in 1996. By that time, it didn't affect gamers quite as much, as games had mostly moved from cartridge to compact disc. The news media moved on, but kept games on their radar, going back to the well over and over again. But to go back to the main point, was the chip shortage real, or a cover-up by Nintendo? Based on all of the evidence I've found for this report, I'm inclined to say, reluctantly, yes, the chip shortage was real. Nintendo was not shorting supply on purpose. These games, Mario 2 and Zelda 2, were planned out far in advance. They required components that were just not available, and this coincided with a swell in demand, 
that no one was expecting. Nintendo could have handled it all better, but were genuinely caught off guard, despite however happy they were for free advertising. However, the chip shortage and the later revelations of how Nintendo conducted business really turned me off from them after the NES days, even though many of their games were good. In the end, being nuts for Nintendo really taught us a lot. We learned how the behind-the-scenes work from Nintendo was done. We learned how games were manufactured and that they came from Japan. We learned that they took time and money and were more than just graphics on screen. And we learned to have a little patience in that maybe Santa couldn't bring everything we asked for. And that we might have to leave it up to the Easter Bunny. Or maybe next year's birthday. Thank you for watching. Please share your thoughts and opinions below. Then, if you're a new viewer, subscribe and turn on the notification bell for future updates. Then, watch one of these videos from the GTV archives. We'll see you there.